Jesus said, I have come not to call, I've come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. Hmm. Perhaps it's because the righteous feel all good. I'm all good. I'm good, thanks. But the sinner has to say, finds himself saying, I need you. I want to tell you a story, and because I love you, and genuinely I do, and I hope you know that genuinely, I'm going to forewarn you, you might get defensive by this story. (laughs) So if you do, just make a note, hang on, and um, stick together through the rest of the sermon. I have a friend who will say, I'm just a sinner. This is his favorite excuse for doing wrong things. And it makes me wonder, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that you're just a sinner? Because if you did, I think you would know God's mercy in your life. And you would know it so much that you'd be an agent of that mercy in everything. And I don't see this happening in this guy. What he's used his Facebook for to hurt people, to insult folks, I've been amazed at how cruel he can be on that page whether it be transgender people or Black Lives Matter, he is, he's ready for a fight. Now, I have to say, he is a white man of a certain age. And there's nothing wrong with being a white man. Nothing. I got a great one I'm married here to for 31 years. So if you need evidence, here, Michael Alltop is. (laughs) Not to put him on a pedestal or anything, because I wouldn't want to do that to him. But... This world has been such that the person I'm referring to, his hard work has gotten him things. He's worked hard for what he's done, but his work has actually brought about the fruits of what he was hoping for, and that's the difference in the world now from the world then. He's feeling the cramp, that what he wants to make happen isn't happening, and he's hurt, and he's angry, and he's frustrated, and he has lost the peace that passes understanding. And so he lashes out, and he says, well, I'm just a sinner. Mm, Somehow, it just doesn't sit right with me. It seems that he has forgotten of what that actually means. Sinners know that they need something. They know that they are unworthy, and so they are glad to receive the mantle of God's mercy over and again to make them worthy and to reveal that to everyone with whom they come in contact. I want to share with you an illustration of what God's mercy is about, something that I heard through my favorite podcast, Turning to the Mystics. This one was on Teresa of Avila, and the illustration that Teresa invites us to consider of God as love, as a spring welling up you know, you've seen a spring, right? It just keeps coming. It keeps coming. It just, it just keeps coming. It splashes around, runs around. It can't even be caught. Stuff is wasted, and it just, it's a source. Teresa invites us to consider this image as God. God is the spring, spilling out, spilling out. And in God's spilling out of God's mercy and love, God creates the world. It's God's love just spilling out over and again, whether it be the sun and the moon, or the seasons, or the waters, or the lands, or the animals, or us. It's God's love spilling out. And each of us have been created in God's spilling of love. And we have been made as a vessel for that very love. One that can receive this spilling so much that it fills us up and it spills out of us. That's what Teresa invites us to recognize. Now, you might note that if you were to envision yourself as a vase, maybe you've got some rocks down there at the bottom, some viney things that are a little dense, so the water doesn't get all the way down, and, you know, so the water might be a little shallow, but it's still there. The invitation from Teresa's illustration and to each of us is to do what we can to clear out the bottom of that, this vessel that we are so that God's water can run deep within us and spill out. If you imagine this, even if you sit with it a little later today and meditate on it, you'll recognize the difference between a shallow body of water and a deep one, what comes out of it. Our faith 
is our ability to make more room for God's love to flow in and through us, and that God will increase our capacity as we let God's mercy come. And you know that rocks get moved by water, right? Things get washed through and tumbled over, and the water takes up all the space there is. This is what Teresa is inviting us to consider about God's love. But the righteous think, I'm all good. I'm good. We say, I thank you, God, that I'm not like them. I actually vote to protect bodily autonomy and family freedom. I put yard signs in my yard. I advocate for this through the ballot box. I give money to political campaigns. I intend anti-racism training, and I show up for pride events. I'm all good. But our question from the divine who loves us, is love, and made us for love, is back to us to say, why are you letting all this stuff justify you? You wrongly believe that you can exist outside of God. You sacrifice the truth that all things are in God. All things, all people, all things are in God. You sacrifice your own humanity, pitting yourself a bit as an us against them. You say, I'll just be a cog in the wheel of political movements. And God knows this because of what happens to us when we believe we can live without God. We become less human. We're cruel to others. We judge them. We're spiteful, angry, greedy, possessive, defensive. The question that our gospel has today is, do you really love being right so much that you'd sacrifice your humanity? Do you really love your individualism so much that you'd give up your interconnectedness with all beings? Are you, right, are you saying, I'd rather give up being human than to be merciful? I'd rather cling to my righteousness than allow myself to be an agent of God's infinite mercy. I mean, like, where's that going to take me? The righteous say, I got this. I'm all good. The sinner says, I need you. And this is the paradox. I'm sure you see it. You're smart people. And if you don't see it, you feel it. In order to be more human, to be more fully alive, we need to recognize that we need God's mercy, and it is God's mercy that makes us righteous. We can't do it, no matter what we do. We need God in order to practice mercy in our lives. It's only through God's mercy that we even know what mercy is, and it's only through God's mercy that God's mercy can spill out through our lives. We literally can't do it. It's God's mercy flowing in us and through us which makes us righteous. And if we can recognize that we're sinners and that we, in our sinfulness, always try to live without God, then we actually have a chance of being healed from that which is destroying us. Admission is the first step to healing. Once we recognize that we have a disease, we can look for and participate in the healing that is available to us Look at how available Jesus is. And do you hear this as the good news that it is in this paradox? Jesus says, when the sinners say, come sit with us, Jesus says, oh, these people are actually going to listen to me. When the father comes to him, a leader in the synagogue, and recognizes that he cannot save himself or his daughter, a very human discovery. Jesus says, I can do this. When the woman touches his cloak, she knows that there is nothing that can heal her but Jesus, and he gives it to her freely. It makes me wonder sometimes as I witness the suffering in the world, which is not fun to notice. Surely you feel the same way. It just makes me wonder, do we have to wait for suffering in order to have the will to turn to Jesus? Why can't we say, God, I want to turn to you when it's sunny outside? Why can't we say, God, I want to turn to you when I actually do have money in my bank account? I want to turn to you when I'm getting along with my family and friends. I want to turn to you when my body feels good and works. 
God says to us, great, because you know what? I'm not waiting for you to be bleeding in order to determine to offer you my saving help. It's always there, like a spring welling up, splashing around. It's just lots wasted. Think of all the mercy I give away, and it just gets squandered. It becomes barren. Jesus says, I'm spilling out my help and restoration now. In fact, my mercy is constantly wasted, and I don't evaluate my decision to share it on that. God says to us, I'm not waiting for you to be suffering in order to decide to offer you my saving help. That's you. You wait until you're suffering before receiving my saving help. It's always there. I'm not waiting for you to start anything, and I'm not waiting for you to stop anything. A few weeks back, I asked about, I've asked y'all if you were here, um, if you had the capacity to forgive more. You might remember, I said, perhaps you're good at forgiveness, and you say, I'm all good, but what if you could forgive more? What might happen? How might God be inviting you to increase your capacity to love? When you sit with that question, how does God answer it? God, what might you have me do in order for your mercy to increase within me? And then you can bite your nails or grip the steering wheel, being ready for something big. But as you know, God is generous and gentle, and it will become just the next step. I remember in my prayer life um, when I was first learning how to pray without being in charge of it, um, that was actually what I was aspiring to do. And my spiritual director said, yeah, you can do that. She said, just sit and say to God, what is your prayer in me today? I was like, oh, all righty. So I did. Sat there in the wee hours of the morning. The house was quiet. My little chair. And I said, God, what's your prayer in me today? And God said, be open. And I was like, that's it? Do you feel me here? <laughs> that's it? But then on the reverse side, I was like, oh, what's going to happen today? <laughs> what's going to happen today that I'm going to grip on, I'm going to clamp down and not receive God's merciful love in me? I went to a workshop this past Thursday and Friday. You know Friday is my Sabbath day, which I always let God run the church without me for 24 hours. But I decided to give it to God in attending this conference on the topic undoing racism something that I commit myself to over and again in all various ways. I'm waiting to hear some of the same things twice um, so that I can know that I've made the lap. So I was in this, and one of the leaders was talking about the structures of our society that have got us pitted against one another, just how the world is working. She was talking about competition and how we're, we're bred for this, in a sense, and how we encourage it in one another. And she said, as a kid, my daddy always said to me that I should fight to be the lead dog. I should be in the front to go first. One of his favorite sayings was, unless you're the lead dog, the scenery never changes. Is that funny? <laughs> have you had a dog's butt in your face ever before? I have. <laughs> I laughed out loud at this because I'm like, oh gosh, I don't really want that in my face. But I thought then about this passage here with Jesus saying, follow me. Are we willing to be always looking at the back of Jesus? Perhaps we're tempted. We say, I want to go first. I want to chart the path. I want to make the discovery. I want to be the one credited with getting us there. I want some people to say to me, good job, because I was out on front. The paradox here is that the people that we're still talking about thousands of years later were following. The people such as Abraham, thousands of years ago, folks, and his story is still told. He's the one who trusted and followed God's promise. That's all he had. He was the father of many nations, not because of his strategic alliances, not because of his conquering other lands and fathering many children through many women or various parts of the world, but because he believed in God's promise. He didn't understand it, but he believed in it. 
And so, as you know, I hope you know, I want to reiterate that I want to tell you the truth because I love you. If you want to do great things, you need to follow Jesus. You need to check yourself that Jesus is in front and that if he were to turn around, he'd see you on his path. And it's the path of mercy. It's going to take each of us a lifetime to get good at this, my friends. So don't go, don't go thinking that you're going to master it in any time frame, because God's mercy knows no bounds. To the extent you're good at it, God will let you be good at it more. And this means that it will continue to increase in you all the days of your life, as long as you let it. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.